Histories. As Carolyn said, Winter Witness was nominated for an Agatha, a Silver Falchion, and a Chanticleer Mystery and Mayhem Award. Good job, Tina. Um, the second book in the series is Dead Man's Leap, came out in April, and reviewers have called Tina the Louise Penny of the Catskills. She lives in Catskill, New York, and her husband Dennis and their cat, Shelby, with her husband and their cat, Shelby, where they tend bees and harvest shiitake mushrooms. She winters in Florida and travels to Japan often to visit her son. Here's a little bit about Dead Man's Leap. Uh, when a storm forces the villagers of Batavia on Hudson, don't you love the name of that town, uh, to seek shelter, the river rises and so do tempers. The flood washes up a corpse and a priceless Japanese artifact. And Bianca St. Dennis finds herself teaming up with the sheriff once again to solve the mystery. Welcome, Tina. Um, in general, your series are not centered on artifacts. How did you choose the artifact that you did uh, in this book and why did you decide to incorporate it into Dead Men's Leap? How does it tie into your series? Right, um, my books don't usually center around an artifact as yours do. Um, my story, my first book was Winter Witness. It takes place in a fictitious Hudson Valley community. And, um, but the second book really centers around this antique dealer, former antique dealer. And um, he works for an important auction house, but he just, he moves on. He tries to... Tina, could you speak up a little bit? Absolutely. Let me see if I can move. Thank you. Up. Is that better? Yes. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, so it, it, a lot of this book centers around this antique, former antiques dealer who worked for an important auction house, moved to Batavian Hudson to put his that life behind him there's some shady business in his past and he's trying to just move forward and um and there in fact a lot of the uh characters in this book in particular have secrets that they're really trying to leave in the past and kind of outpace their past right um and so because it, it centers around this particular antique seller there is this artifact and it's a japanese artifact called the next day um actually i have a book here so you can see how it's called and um they're wooden um, or ivory carved sculptures, and they're usually decorative that the Japanese wore, men wore in traditional garb, and they have holes in them, and it ties to their obi belts. And so, um, and this particular artifact I chose, um, it could have been anything because he's an antique dealer, but um, Yanka, my main character, has a son who lives in Japan. And she has, um, and the village of Batavia Hudson has a villager who's a Japanese American. And so I wanted to tie that in. And so I chose, um, and I also chose a particular um, artifact, a particular Netsuke of Ebisu, who's a, one of the seven gods of, of good fortune. And he also protects fishermen. So part of my story is about a fishing tournament. It's about a storm and the river overflowing. So I kind of tied it up that way. And so the idea was to tie in this book with the next book. So my third book of the series is Autumn Embers, and that will take place in Kyoto, Japan. And it will carry a little bit of this story forward. It has to do with the next day, and then it has its own separate story as well. So there is a tie-in um, uh, into the series, but again, I don't usually write artifacts. That's true. That's so that's so interesting. And I read the book and it, it's great. Um, so Tina and the rest of us will be putting our websites and email addresses in the chat, but we hope that you will put questions for us in the chat because uh, we would we love talking to readers. Yeah, so I did. I just put my website in there and our newsletters are usually you can sign up uh, on our website. So please. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to take some time now and introduce you to Mary. Um, Mae Manin's debut novel, Death in the Aegean, came out last month from Level Best Books. Her short stories have appeared in Malice Domestic and Pulp Anthologies, as well as Black Cat Mystery Magazine. Uh, her nonfiction endeavors include articles on gardening and Victorian reception of ancient Egypt. Um, an avocational archaeologist and a USAF veteran, Mary divides her time between writing, traveling, and hiking. She lives in Kansas City, Missouri, with her husband and two Siberian Huskies. Um, let me tell you a little bit about her book, Death in the Aegean. When former archaeology student Stephanie <clears throat> Adams travels to Greece, she's suspected of murdering a wealthy bride who accused her deceased father of artifact theft. Sounds great. Um, your book, Mary, blends archaeology, romance, and a museum of a precious artifact. 
Can you tell us a little bit more? What inspired it? Can you give us some? Uh, so, hello, everyone. Um, I'd have to say that those two little words, what if, uh, inspired this story. Um, I've always been interested in archaeology. Um, so when my husband and I went to Santorini, uh, I made sure that we went to the archaeological site of Akrotiri, which is a Minoan town that was buried uh, under the ash of a volcano. Um, that was in roughly 1628 BC, give or take a few years. I was fascinated to learn that although they've excavated lots of buildings and streets and found lots of household items and uh, loom weights, they only found a single gold item. But nearby on Crete, which was also a center of the Minoan culture at the same time, um, Sir Arthur Evans discovered uh, two snake goddesses when he excavated at Knossos. And I thought, what if, what if excavators find a a beautiful gold snake goddess statue at Akrotiri. What kind of people would come see it? And how would they interact with each other? Um, human nature being what it is, um, surely someone would covet it. And my heroine, Stephanie Adams, discovers that the hard way when the Akrotiri snake goddess is stolen, she gets in, involved in international intrigue, theft, and murder. So that's- I love the what if. <laughs> so now I'm going to introduce you to our next speaker, Connie Berry. So best-selling author Connie Berry's dream of becoming an archaeologist ended when she learned there was more to it than discovering the tombs of long-lost pharaohs. Instead, she created Kate, the Kate Hamilton Mystery Series, set in the UK and featuring an American antique dealer with a gift for solving crimes. Connie was raised by antique dealers who instilled in her a passion for history, art, and foreign travel. She loves knitting, cute animals, and all things British. Connie lives in Ohio with her husband and adorable dog, Emmy. And then we have some, uh, some wonderful news today. Connie has just learned that her book, The Art of Betrayal, is a finalist for the Daphne Award for Mainstream Mysteries, written in 2021. So congratulations, Connie on that. Well, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> it's lovely to be here. I appreciate that. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about The Shadow of Memory, her current book. As Kate Hamilton contemplates her future with Detective Inspector Tom Mallory, she is also helping her colleague Ivor Tweedy organize an upcoming auction in the seaside village on the Suffolk coast. Netherfield Sanitarium, Sanatorium, an abandoned Victorian insane asylum, is being converted into luxury townhouses. But when retired criminal inspector Will Parker is found dead, Kate discovers that the halls of the sanatorium housed much more than priceless art. So, Connie, this is the fourth Kate Hamilton book, and she's the one with the artistic sensitivities and the knack of finding herself in the midst of a murder. Why did you choose an antiques dealer for your protagonist. Uh, well, th thank you, Mary. And, and again, thank you so much, all those who are here tonight. Um, the easy answer to that question is because that's the world that I grew up in. Um, Mary mentioned that my parents were high-end antiques dealers. Um, they uh, operated around the uh, Northern Illinois, Southern Wisconsin area, but they really had um, a national reputation at that time. This is quite a long time ago, um, but that is just the world that I lived in. So um, our, our house was filled with antiques. Um, one of the things that we had in our living room for a while, we had a life-size marble bust of Marie Antoinette, and then that, that went away, and then that was replaced by uh, a, a, about three-quarter life-size statue of the three graces and of course you know when you're growing up you you don't think that your house is strange um so i just took it as as granted but i learned later that my friends thought it was very very weird and actually when my um, husband first came to visit my parents i think he had a few second thoughts because <laughs> his, his house looked 
it, his house was lovely, but it looked a little bit like a motel room. There wasn't anything on the tables and my house is very, very crowded. So that's just what I knew. So they always say, write what you know. So I did that, but actually there is a deeper reason as well, because um, in all of my books, one of the themes that underlies all of them is the effect of the past on the present. And that would be um, personally, uh, culturally, nationally. And so I thought that um, objects of art, antiquities and antiques, are a little bit like time travel because these are objects of the past that have survived and have come into the present. They have a story, they have a history. And um, one of the things that my mother used to love to do was to delve into that and to learn as much as she could about the objects. And um, she would say that that way, when someone would buy something, they're not just buying an object, they're buying a piece of history. And so that just um, has kind of formed my, my thinking. And I've had a lot of fun writing mysteries around uh, an antiques and antiquities. And um, I, I now have the privilege of introducing the wonderful author, um, Nina Waxman. Nina is a former ad agency creative director, and she now runs a digital marketing company in New York City. Her mystery story appears in the anthology Justice for All, Murder New York Style 5. And she has stories which will appear in upcoming horror anthologies and mystery magazines. And her debut novel of historical suspense, The Gallery of Beauties, will be published this month. Is, is that right, Nina? This month by Level Best Books. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that book. It's Venice 1612. A Golden Age for Women of Talent, Beauty, and Ambition. Two very different women, a notorious courtesan and a rabbi's daughter, are brought together by an artist who chooses them as subjects for a gallery of beauties, portraits of the most beautiful women of Venice. And Nina, I, I just am curious about this. What is it about the artist and the portrait that motivated your heroine to leave the ghetto, which would have been a very dangerous thing to do and something a woman in her position would would probably never do. Well, thanks a lot, Connie, for the introduction. And it's really exciting to um, for me for to explore this topic because the ghetto is the first ghetto ever created with named, and the word ghetto comes from ghetto, which was a quarry, and it comes from Venice. So the first ghetto ever that was made for Jews was in Venice. So, and in a way, by this time, that was happened earlier on, but by the 1600s, which is the time of my story, um, Jews had a lot more freedoms than they had earlier on. They were allowed to leave the ghetto from time to time. But in general, um, the ghetto was protected and it had limitations too. So my character, Although she's the she's a woman, she's a widow and the rabbi's daughter. If a the worst thing was if the ghettos were locked up at night, and if a Jew was found outside the ghetto at night, they could be either fined or imprisoned, depending on what the what the ruling parties at the time thought. But aside from that, her role in the ghetto was you know just being the daughter, a wife. But since she lost her husband, she's not she doesn't really have that role anymore. So she's living with her parents and taking care of her aged parents. Luckily for her, her father has allowed her to study his books. So she studied all his, you know, Judaica books, his Talmud, but also he's also a healer and he has a compendium of medical, um, of, of medicines that she studied as well. And she is able to concoct some remedies and sell those to, to aid their income. But after a while, there's what else is there? And she realizes that if she just continues her life as it is, that's what it'll be. It'll be living with her parents. She doesn't know if she's going to be able to marry somebody else. She will just be concocting her resumes and learning the same old thing. Her learning is the only thing that gives her any excitement. So when the artist approaches her in the marketplace, even though it's a bizarre 
uh, request for him to ask to paint her, and she never even thought about her outward appearance because she's so interested in intellectual things. But suddenly she sees it as her ticket out of the ghetto and out of a different light. And so her intellectual curiosity gets the better of her in that she wants to try to experience things outside of the ghetto, as well as the idea of art, which, and that was a very big part since I was an art director and I've studied art, was the, the intrigue of art to a Jew in the ghetto. They didn't have any artists in their acquaintance. The only artist they might have seen is a scribe. And so understanding, and there was, and here you're in the middle of Venice with this, all the great painters, the artists everywhere. There's art everywhere. And she's been left out of it. So the fact that art was such a mystery to her that she wanted to understand and she even believed that there was a mystical aspect to art and that when the artist painted his subjects, perhaps there was this transfer of the souls that occurs while he paints his subjects. So part of it is to learn about the art, and part of it is this intrigue of whether there is actual a transference of souls that might occur with her. You know, if you remember, ancient peoples used to be afraid to get their photos taken. You know, if you go to Africa, they'll be afraid to get their photos taken because they think you're capturing their souls. So there was this inherent belief that when you depict somebody, when an artist paints you, there might be this transference of soul that somehow they're connecting to you on that level. So both of those, override her fears and because her father also ventures out of the ghetto into into a no-no um, also because he her, her father um, is also a addicted gambler so he spends his nights leaving the ghetto which was also dangerous to go to the gaming tables so she'd inherited a little bit of that dangerous edge to her as well so those are all the factors that that come into play so it's intellectual, it's emotional, and it's also a little bit of a genetic predisposition, I would say. <laughs> so now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to introduce the person who has the easiest name to pronounce here, Lane Stone. <laughs> and um, Lane is a baby boomer and a dog mom. And she's author of this exciting new trilogy called the Big Picture Trilogy, of which the first book, which you can see in the back of her, is The Collector. She also writes the Old Town Antiques Mystery, and she has a book coming out in that series called Dead Men Don't Decorate, which is coming out in 2022. And she lives in Alexandria, Virginia during the week, and Lewes, Delaware on the weekend. But what I'm really excited to tell you about, aside from Lane, who's a fun person as it is, is about her book, The Collector, which is the first installment of her thriller trilogy. And it's about an art expert, Emma Kelly, whose life looks like a masterpiece, but she's keeping a very big secret and one I don't know if any of us could handle. She has two husbands. So Lane, the interesting thing about her book, which has been described by her publisher, as a cross of Dan Brown meets a female James Bond in the art world. Whatever made you concoct a story like this? Well, I was certainly flattered, um, you know, when she, when she said that. I've been <laughs> writing cozies for many years, and so I wanted to write about a woman uh, living the most outrageous life possible. Someone who honestly does not care what the world about the world's rules anymore. Um, but, you know, like it, as you said, I have a cozy coming out in November, and I promise I'll behave then. <laughs> uh, let's, I have a, a few questions here. Um, first, why write about art? Um, why do you find it a rich area to build a story around? For me, I write because the power of objects is real and certain things have a hold over us. Tina, how do you, how would you answer that? What I think is so interesting about art and artifacts is that, you know, grief plays such an important part in many of these stories, but there is a uniqueness to these, art, these artifacts, right? So it kind of ramps up that read factor, right? They're unique, they're irreplaceable, they're, you know, they just play with our imagination. People collect, um, you know, under the most unusual circumstances. So I think it's really just how it captures our imagination and that irreplaceable factor. Yeah. Mary, how would you um, I'd say that uh, for me, um, I was a military brat growing up in Germany 
And I spent a lot of field trips and weekends going to churches, castles, and museums. And um, so my appreciation of art and old things uh, started very early. And it, that in, continued as an adult. It, I went to Germany in the Air Force and I got out, but my husband did. And then thanks to Uncle Sam, we went to the Netherlands. We've lived in the Netherlands, England and Spain. And uh, of course there are more churches and castles and uh, museums. So I come by that honestly. Um, so I, uh, did you ask about research or? Not yet. Should I? No? Go okay. ahead if you want I'll, to. Go ahead. I'll just, no, I'll stop there. That's okay. okay. <laughs> Nina? Yeah, so I was going to say, one of the things about art and what it intrigued, and I went to art school, so I've learned it firsthand, is that art engages the heart, the mind, the senses. Mm -hmm. And it can take you into different places. And what's interesting with me, when I did the Gallery of Beauties, it was based on a real Gallery of Beauties that I saw in Munich, um, where, and this was a commonplace thing that kings did, is they had the portraits of beautiful women painted for their castles because it soothed them, some of them. Some of them liked it because it was like, I guess, playboy for them, but like Charles II. But most of them, so art could soothe the soul, art could calm you, it could calm your spirit, it can intrigue you, it could make you lust after something. You know, how many paintings out there, like Goya's Naked Maja and other classic art. Um, really inspired not just greed, but lust. So you could have get the seven deadly sins from art, or you could get, you could arouse great, you know, um, elevated passion, like there was a lot of religious art too. So it really engaged the senses, the mind, and it could make people do things or want things that they never wanted before. Honey? Yeah, I, I'm just listening. I'm, I'm fascinated to, to hear what you all are saying, and, and I actually agree with, with all of it. Um, I, um, my interest is not so much in art as it is in antiques and antiquities. And, and again, as I said before, it's the element of something from the past that exists in the present. Mm -hmm. And um, as I said, every object has a history mm -hmm. and um, I love to unfold the history of an object so in in my books it's not just the fact that they are very expensive or um, very very precious or there's only one of a kind it's also how did that object get from the past into the present mm -hmm. and how did that process um, how does that now impact people's lives today mm -hmm. and um, and I, I hope that I have been able to accomplish that. The object in the book that I have just written that just came out in May, um, May 10th was a 15th century painting by the Dutch artist Jan van Eyck. And um, it is a very emotional piece of art. Um, it is, uh, it has been hanging in this insane asylum for 150 years, uh, so the problem is, is it the real thing? Yeah. So the next part of the question is about research. How mm -hmm. did you do your research and did you discover any uh, interesting tidbits that you can share? I have a postgraduate certification in art crime and antiquity stuff, but, um, and Tina, you, Nina, you said that you, you have a degree in art. You want to tell us mm -hmm. more about that? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so I've studied art in all the different styles of painting from different eras, which was very helpful to me. So because I have scenes where I describe, you know, my lead character, Diana, wants to understand how the artist paints. So I was able to actually explain how the process for doing a portrait was at that time period. But what's interesting to me is when I go, I go to Venice a lot, I go every two years to the Art Biennale, which is the preview of the latest art. Um, but I also discovered a lot of galleries there that are very small galleries and, you know, Venice was a big center for art. In fact, I, you know, a lot of the aristocrats from England and other countries would go to Italy to cap, to buy, to collect art that they'd find in, in Italy. Um, so one of the things I've learned from looking at the artwork was all these practices, people painted Carnival a lot. 
and I found paintings of Carnival, which showed something that I didn't know happened, which was they had a running of the bulls at Carnival, and they used to run over the Rialto Bridge, but there it was in a painting. I found it. Um, so he, who knew that? And they had bullfights in San Marco also because there was the the um, the meat guild, what he called the butcher's guild. They would stage these performances as part of their celebration of Carnival. It's not written about anywhere, but when I went to this art gallery, I saw all these paintings that showed all these paintings of Carnival that were depicted at that time. So I learned about that interesting practice. That's fascinating. Um, Tina, what kind of research did you do? Other than going to Japan to see, you know. Yes, going to Japan, <laughs> that tough research that I yeah. do. So, so my son moved to Japan 12 years ago. And since, he, you know, from the moment he left, I've been, you know, so fascinated with the culture. And I go regularly, not as regularly lately as I'd like to, but they're opening their borders again. So I'm hoping to get there in the next few months. I'm thrilled. Um, so between my travels there and between having contacts there, because over these years, you know, he has contacts at universities and, and all kinds of crafts and all kinds of walks of life there so I have people I can double check things with and um, I have an extensive library because that's what I do I read and um, when I became interested in the culture it was all about um, just kind of absorbing it all so and of course there's the wonderful internet um, which is always there as backup and um, I found um, an interesting tidbit which I loved to, about these netskis these little statuettes that um, I don't have one here with me that is the artifact in my story is that when an artist would create one, would um, make one for someone of significantly higher, you know, social rank, um, they did not sign them. And, you know, it seems a little counterintuitive. I'm not, you know, an art, uh, I don't have the degree like Nina. So I, I was surprised to find that, you know, a signature wouldn't, wouldn't be there intentionally, sort of like a humility thing you know um so i thought that was a really interesting little tidbit it did i think it gets it is mentioned in my book in fact because it becomes important sort of um but there's lots of great stuff you can find you know you start going down that little rabbit hole call it that right exactly <laughs> you know and there's so much you just can't you can't do it all yeah yeah mary um well of course, I went to uh, Santorini in Crete, which I absolutely loved. And I spent a lot of time in the museums, um, particularly on Crete, in the Heraklion Museum. They have um, just a beautiful, beautiful collection of Minoan gold, which was really um, remarkably advanced uh, and elaborate for its time period. But then, of course, when I got home, um, I had to hit the books and do a little more in-depth research. And so I went to my local college, UMKC, library card there and spent a lot of time in their libraries and also um, dug through a lot of academic journals on JSTOR. So now the one interesting thing that I did discover about Akrotiri, which um, I think is very interesting, is that unlike in Pompeii, which was also a, in, ancient town buried by a volcanic uh, eruption, mm -hmm. no human remains have been found in Akrotiri. Mm -hmm. So it appears that the volcano gave um, adequate uh, forewarning and, and everyone sailed away, hopefully to safety. But that, I thought that was very interesting. No, yeah. no victims at all. That's fascinating. Connie? Well, first of all, I just want to say um, to Tina that my parents collected Netskis, so oh, I'm very yeah. familiar with them, and, and they are lovely, lovely little objects of art. Yeah. But, um, but in terms of research, um, mm -hmm. what, what is interesting to me about art forgery is the fact that it is ancient. It is definitely not something that is new, but um, there, with, with modern technology, actually, fairly recent technology, um, art, art um, forgeries are now able to be detected where they could not before. In the past, um, attributing a painting to a particular artist had to do with style, brush strokes, signatures, um, provenance, you know, things like that. But now, with things like um, radiography and spectrography and, and things like that, they can actually look 
on a microscopic level and see um, things that are embedded in the pigments and the binders. And it's very true that you can use all of the materials of the past. You can gather all of the right pigments and all of the right binders. You can have the right techniques. You can use um, an old medium like boards or, you know, all of that. But what you can't do is control the present. Something from the present will always embed itself in that paint. And that's what modern technology can detect. And I was inspired actually by a fairly recent story. I think it was 2012 where um, in London, Sotheby's auction house bought uh, a Franz Halls painting from a Mayfair gallery and they auctioned it off and sold it to an American collector for $10 million. And then it was subsequently subjected to spectrography and it was found to be um, a forgery. And so they had to take it back, they had to refund the $10 million and then they went after the Mayfair Art Gallery who tried to claim that they knew nothing about this but as a matter of fact, they had had several other paintings that also had been deemed to be forgeries. And um, there was a very, very talented artist who was, was um, painting these things. And one of them was owned by um, the Prince of Liechtenstein. It was, uh, I think, uh, uh, Cronach the Elder. Um, and he was oh, just yeah. so talented that he could actually pull this off and he could... Um, mimic the styles of many paintings, but what he could not do was ensure that nothing of the modern world, and um, I think in his case it was a little piece of um, a fiber from the modern world that was caught in one of the um, little tiny pieces of pigment. Something like nylon or polyester? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, Let's talk about setting. And Mary, I, I, wait, I wait, love okay. Lane, before we go on to setting, tell us about your art uh, certification. Oh, we want to hear yeah, about that. It, it was fascinating. I, I, it was, you know, about art crying more than art. Um, and um, I, I just ended up seeing so many things different than, than I had before. Um, and uh, so it was, it was just fascinating. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely using all of that. Um, and one of the, the, yeah. in the antiquity stuff portion, we talked about, like if someone is a subsistence looter and they're taking things in their backyard and selling them for food for their family, that's, they're called a criminal. But if a, <laughs> you know, an example, Rockefeller does their world tour and takes all the artifacts they want and donates it to the Met, that's different, you know? So right. it's just, I, I love seeing things uh, differently. Thank you. For asking Lee, that. I also wanted to take a moment that someone put a question in the chat asking about that, but also asked, where did you study it? How, how does one- It was know? online. Mm -hmm. Is there, I, I think- the University of Glasgow is the one that I use oh. because I had heard about this one particular professor and I knew that I wanted to study under her. She um, is an expert in um, um, not just art, uh, but also uh, uh, law enforcement. Oh, yeah. oh, wow. Yeah. Nice connection. I think yeah. there was another question in the chat also about where do we find our um, bad guys, our uh, oh. villains, our guilty yeah. parties, which I think is a great question. Yeah. Who wants to take that one? I'll just start with that because yeah. one of the things I started writing, a lot of times you can plot out your book and figure out what's going to happen in the beginning, what's going to happen in the middle, and what's going to happen in the end, who's going to get murdered, who's going to be the guilty party. And then as you write it, all of a sudden it changes. And the reason for me it changes is I started writing a character and what I do after learning this from another writer is I start channeling a famous movie actor that I could see playing the role. So I was writing this character of a nobleman, jaded, bored nobleman, and all of a sudden I started channeling George Sanders. I don't know if anybody remembers him, but he was a 1940s movie star. He was known for playing, he was in Rebecca. He was played King Charles II in uh, Forever Amber, and he just had the. He also played um, in Picture of Dorian Gray, 
But that jaded voice and that persona, I just started seeing my character and all of a sudden he took off. So he became a bad guy, sort of a good guy, sort of a guy you liked who was a bad guy because I started thinking of George Sander in some of those roles and I wanted, you know, I couldn't, I, I, I made him a bad guy, but then he became kind of a good guy. So that, that helps you flesh out a character and decide what are their motivations, what is their persona. So that was, that's what works for me and how I devise my bad guys. Yeah. Well, I, I'd like to say that, number one, you have to make sure they blend in and don't look mm -hmm. like a bad guy. Yeah. Right. right. And, and, you know, one of the, the interesting things, I think, is to make every character um, kind of a full-rounded person. And so mm -hmm. oh, good point. nobody is completely good and nobody is completely bad. And mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I wanted to do with my villains or my antagonist anyway, because I do talk about um, antiques and antiquities in, in all of my books in this series, is it, it has to be more than just, it's a valuable object, somebody wants to steal it to make money. Mm -hmm. And so um, what I found really interesting was to develop reasons why this person would do what they did that had more um, complexity than just poor money. And that was just pretty fun. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you that you want to flesh everyone out. And with Mary's point about um, they have to fit in, right? So for mm -hmm. me, I really, I think it's so important for my books that everybody is very ordinary in a good way, yeah. you know, and that you can find all the this depth um, within these people that appear ordinary, right, and are actually rather extraordinary. And that goes for your villain as well, because, um, you know, they're just flawed people. We're all flawed people. And so I, I really enjoy writing characters that, as you both said, are kind of are well-rounded and with the right motivation could do mm -hmm. anything. Right? Yeah, right. Good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. extenuating circumstance can, turn, can yeah. turn a normal person into a How murderer. do they see what they're doing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have another question here that's interesting um, from Ashley. Um, for writing about your subjects of art and artifacts, are you studying mm -hmm. primarily the primary sources or in the original thing, such as original paintings before writing? If not sure, you are using like a secondary source and the kind of imaging, um, what it would have looked like um, in its own time if you do, if you don't have the original thing or artifact. I'm wondering how much originality goes into it versus your imagination, uh, you know, your uh, creative uh, twist to write these books. I found myself, if it was a painting that was going to be destroyed, I used a fake painting, I made it up. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I just couldn't, you know, it's like, my heart, <laughs> Kill it. you know, uh, but otherwise I didn't, and I just do tons of research. Um, um, okay. So who else wants to take a stab at that? Is there anything you do? You, uh, and also you, Mary, you mentioned JSTOR and which is great. Yeah. Oh yeah. The academic articles. Yeah. Well, I, okay. So my artifact in Death in the Aegean is, um, it doesn't exist. It's a, it's a gold uh, gold snake goddess statue, and the, there have been a number of snake goddess statues found, and I, I use the way they look mm -hmm. along with my imagination and made them out of gold instead of this faience or ceramic. Yeah. Um, because I, I do believe it, it could well have happened, but I used a little bit of both. Yeah. For mine. And I, my, my artifact is also, fi also fictitious. It's I, I do a lot of that. Well, my village is fictitious <laughs> because it just gives but, me latitude, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's based. Con it's based. It's on based it. on it. Yeah, you can take like Connie. Your your Jan van Eyck was it fictitious oh. or it sounded the, real to me? The painting is not real, but Jan van Eyck is a right. very, very real yeah. painter, and therefore I did have to do a lot of research, and I. Um, Nina, maybe you you studied him. I don't know, but I did. Uh, yes, <laughs> 15th century. So we're we're talking 1400s, and where a lot of the paintings that of that time were kind of picturing people sort of flat. Yes, flat. Um, his, if you look at some of his paintings, they are so realistic that you could literally 
see that person walking down your street. And he, um, he must have had such good eyesight because his paintings yeah. are so fantastically detailed. You can see the, you know, the two days fur, the beetle, fur on the collar. The, yeah, the fur. And he, um, he, he did one portrait of his wife actually. And right. She was wearing this kind of a linen cap that was sort of ruffled, which was apparently the height of fashion at that time. And um, he wanted that linen to look really like fabric. And so what he did to get that effect was it, it was a dark background, this white linen headdress. And then he went in and with a, just a couple of little hairs of a brush, he pulled the white just almost microscopically into the dark. And what that did was it just softened it. Um, so I am absolutely, after all my research, I am in love with him. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting things we learned in art school about that era of painting was before the Impressionists, people used to start by painting their canvases black. And then they'd layer going from dark to light. And that was always the way you did it. And that's why they got the more three-dimensional effect by layering, 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 layering until they got to the lightest color. The Impressionists hit just turned everything backwards by starting white canvases or a color canvas and then just painting what they saw. So I built that into my story too, but that's how Van Eyck did it too. He, they were very, very detailed. And that's why if you look at somebody like Caravaggio, it looks like those that three-dimensionality of these, these arms that look like they emerge from the darkness. That was part of the technique of how they did that. But I found also, I would love, I looked at paintings a lot for clothing. Because when, I, when you're writing about the 1600s, you don't have a lot of information of how they lived or what they wore. There are some portraits that exist, but especially in, in people of the ghetto, because Jews were not allowed. In order to paint, you had to be part of a guild. You had to have an apprenticeship, and Jews would never be allowed to be in a guild or to have an apprenticeship. So there are not a lot of portraits. And the only reasons the portraits survived is they used portraits a lot. Besides, they had some re religious things that you're not allowed to paint people, which was another kind of thing that I discussed in my story. And then as I was writing it, I actually subscribed to another database like JSTORS. It's called Academia. And I found an article written by my character. My, my character is the daughter, is a real daughter of a real rabbi who lived at that time. And he wrote an autobiography. So that's how I learned about him. So it was, it was an autobiography that survived from the 1600s. But he also wrote a treatise on painting and portraiture. And his treatise was about how portraiture should be allowed in the Jewish community because it served a very practical purpose, which King Henry VIII used too. But if, if you wanted to you know, set up a marriage between somebody, how did you see what the other person looked like? Well, you'd send a portrait. So he said from a very practical point of view, you needed portraits because you know, if you want to get your kid married and the bride lives in Amsterdam, you wanted to know what she looked like, you would get a portrait commissioned. So that was one of the things that was very interesting that I looked at a lot of portraits. And actually one of my characters was based on a portrait because I have a visiting Englishman. I love the National Portrait Gallery in London. It's one of my favorite places in the world to go because that's what you can see what a lot of people really looked like. You know, Henry VIII, Elizabeth, Shakespeare, all those pictures that we have in our imaginations come from that National Portrait Gallery. And my character, whose name is uh, Lord Arundel, was known as the collector and his portrait was in there and that's why I read about him. So I, I had to put them in. He was perfect for my story. So. It's interesting. Looking at the original portraits was very helpful to me, yeah. too. Yeah. Um, let's talk about settings. Mary, um, your cover, I love that cover. You know I love that cover. And um, the colors are perfect for your setting. You want to talk about setting a little bit? Um, okay. Uh, of course, the, the blue uh, roofs are famous in Santorini. I don't think you can see it photograph of Santorini without having at least one or two or more blue roofs in there. But um, I set my story in uh, Santorini and Crete because the Greek Isles are a great place to get away. And my heroine, Stephanie, desperately needed to get away. Um, since she was a former archeology span student, 
being there for the opening of the uh, uh, newly discovered treasure, the exhibit of the newly discovered exhibit was um, just the icing on the cake for her. Um, so that's really it, you know, it's really just perfect place to get away and so much to look at. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anybody else want to talk about their setting? How, how about you, Lane? Okay, how well, how um, my character, she is an um, 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 art, um, fine arts title underwriter. And so she is, uh, she uses that as an excuse to make all of these trips to Europe. But if you read the book, you know the big secret, you know, why she really needs to go to Europe. So mm -hmm. um, a lot of time spent in planes, and that was harder to keep up with than I thought it would. Like, could you really go to Barcelona and then be back to Bristol, England, you know, in, in this time frame? Um, and then other than that, it was kind of easy because there's only one Louvre, there's only one Met, there's only one National Gallery. So, but it was fun having written traditionals for so long. It was fun having like a really big playground. Yeah, and um, Connie, yours are set in the English village, English countryside. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah you can kind of see it in the background there, but um, mine are set in the English county of Suffolk, mm -hmm. which um, is not really that well known, although I've noticed that a lot of um, TV police procedurals set in England and now are going to Suffolk. And the reason that, that I love it, I've, I've spent a lot of time there, is because it's not on the tourist track. Um, but it really should be because it is the center of the old Anglo-Saxon culture. Norfolk and Suffolk were literally the North Folk and the South Folk. And mm -hmm. Suffolk is where all of these hordes, Anglo-Saxon hordes, have been dug, dug up. And um, it, it, it's just so historic. The villages are so ancient. Many of them, um, in fact, Lavinum in, in Suffolk is called the most perfect medieval village that, that exists. Wow. Isn't, isn't Lavinum known as the original crooked town? Yes, it, it's wonderful. It has all these lovely crooked buildings and it's just so picturesque. I can hardly stand it. But it is a wonderful- <laughs> Obvious reason. Because Venice is known for its beauty. I mean, it's just a beautiful city on its own, but actually it was a tourist site. One of the tourist reasons a tourist would go to Venice was for the women. Because it had um, it had a book of courtesans, so you could read, you could see about these incredibly beautiful women who were not just beautiful but illustrious. Um, so for me, Venice was really important. You know, was a really perfect setting for this gallery of beauties. And the other thing is, I like that Venice is twisty and turny, and you know, you don't know what you're going to see. It's a city of mystery, and so that seemed to be a perfect setting for a mystery. And the rest of my books are going to be. This is the first of a series. The rest of my books are also going to be set in Venice. So the series is called Venice Beauties. Now, how you could have gone with Florence, right? But I guess Venice, it's easier to, like, sometimes you can't get there from here, you know? I mean, when you're walking around, you you know. Well, it's also because Venice was also a family in my family. So I'm a descendant oh, okay. of oh, the fun. chief rabbi of Venice, who was a contemporary of this um, this uh, the character in my story. And also my mother used to light candlesticks, which talk about artifacts. She turned them over once for us and she showed that they were, torch, they were torch holders. So they were these silver torch holders. You'd put the torch into them and put, you know, it probably stood on alongside the, uh, the palazzo. And evidently people used to go to the ghetto to pawn their silver. So she thinks one of her ancestors must have been a porn broker in the ghetto and got these candlesticks. So that's, that's I always had that connection to Venice from that. Yeah. That's yeah. a really cool story. Yeah. <laughs> and I am, um, uh, I keep checking the chat to see if you have any questions. So if you have questions, please uh, pop them in there uh, right away. Um, I wanted okay. to take a moment on setting as well, because although it doesn't take place, this book, Dead Man's Leap, which talks about that Netscape, takes place in the Hudson Valley in my fictitious Batavia and Hudson. And it has to because the main story has to do about cliffs and the overflowing river. And it's really perfect setting for it. And in fact, it's based on a, um, a, inspired by a true story of someone who did these cliff dives. But, um, but the next book is going to be taking place in Kyoto, Japan. And um, it's, it's not just any place in Japan, right? Kyoto is the old imperial city. And so, and it was not damaged during the wars. So it has 
all this beautiful architecture, all the crafts. It is the, it is the tourist spot for all the Japanese, right? The Imperial um, Gardens and the, and the pagodas. Yeah, the palace. Me, the palace. Thank you. The word just escaped me. I can't <laughs> picture it. I can see it. So the palace is there, and um, the old city of Gion, where the geisha district is. The, one of the geisha districts is there, and mm -hmm. so it's really it's so rich with the textile industry and the um, ceramics and the the enameling, and they have just so much in this one little city. So I'm really excited, one to get back, and two to start writing. Um, you know, to really use that in my writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So, so we have about eight minutes left, Lane. Yeah. Were, were you going to ask for questions or? I Well, I'm, I'm checking the chat and I don't see any more questions and I'm checking the Q&A. Um, uh, so I was going to throw out another question to you all. Um, okay. Who was, or let me ask this one because I love this question. How important is the love undercurrent in your story? Now, I will mm -hmm. answer it saying it was too important, you know. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so... Um, so, Condi, let's start with wait, you. Wait, 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 Lane, before you move on, I was just going to ask you, whatever possessed you to write about a woman with two husbands talks about love undercurrent? It was absolutely undercurrent. the most outrageous thing I could think of, you know? <laughs> and, and yesterday was our, let me see, 32nd year anniversary. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, and I always tell people, you know, how long have you been married? And I'll say 150 years, you know? <laughs> so it is, it's, that's, it was the most outrageous thing I could think of. <laughs> But now people are starting to pick which husband they like the best. Right. And they want to know oh, what good. I'm going to do. Um, yeah. Oh, there's a suspense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that your next story? It's yeah. Book two is uh, The Canvas. And um, I've already started working on that. But she will still have, she won't get caught in book two. But something well, don't tell us that. Don't three. give that away. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't actually, give that away. Let's all talk about what we have next. Tina, yeah. you want to talk about what you're working on now and when it comes out? Um, yeah. So I'm working on um, Autumn Embers. That's book three in the Batavian Hudson series, right? So book one, Winter Witness. Can you see that? Yeah. The covers are great. Leap, of course. And so Autumn Embers is the third book. And um, so that is due out next spring. And I'm working on that. And it, like I said, I think I said this earlier in the uh, broadcast that um, it looks like the borders for Japan are opening up. So I have a very good chance I'll be getting out there again. Mm -hmm. It's been for almost five years now. And I'm getting wow. really upset about it because I was supposed to go four years ago. I was supposed to go three years ago. And then of course, mm -hmm. COVID. So um, yeah, so that's really going to inform a lot of my writing. I've been there, but I really like to be fresh on it. And uh, I just wanted to speak briefly on the romantic undercurrent um, yeah. question, because um, what I love about romance, it's not, my books are not romance, but there, there is romantic tension in various forms, mm -hmm. is because I think it complicates things so nicely, you know. Yeah. So, um, you know, my main character, Bianca, is grieving. Um, the sheriff has a marriage on the rocks. There are a couple of people who, you know, are pining away for each other and everybody's blind to these things. And it, and it just complicates all the other things that are going on yeah. in their lives. And it's one of the reasons why I enjoy writing, the, writing that into my story. Yeah. But who else was going to talk about what's up next? Mary? Um, I'm working on my uh, second book. Here's, here's the cover. The full oh. cover of the first one, Death in the Aegean. Uh, my next book will take place in Italy, both Milan and Venice, and it will be out next May. So I'm pretty excited about that. Have you written it? Is it? Have you turned it in? No, I haven't turned it in. I'm working hard at it. Yeah, Let okay. Realistically. <laughs> well, feel free to use my husband as a character in Venice because when we were doing the obligatory gondola ride, he was waving and saying hi to everybody in the bridge. <laughs> hi, hi, like he was the mayor or something. <laughs> feel free to use that. <laughs> you know, what is up next for you? So this book two in the series is called The Courtesan Secret. So all the same characters come back from the first book. And this time, you know, in the first book, Diana, the rabbi's daughter, is, befriends the character, the courtesan who helps her get out of the ghetto. In book two, the courtesan is being chased by bad guys um, for a secret she has. And she ends up hiding in the ghetto. So we're now looking at Diana's life from the courtesan's side. From the other perspective. Yeah. yeah. Dang. Um, Connie? 
Yes, I am um, actually working on three different projects, oh, um, boy. which isn't necessarily a great thing, but, but I'm working on the fifth book in the Kate Hamilton series, which um, my title so far is The Witness of Blood. I don't know if that will be the go forward title or not, yeah. but I am also working on a possible novella to have out before that fifth book comes out. So it would be like book 4.5 um, in, in the Kane Hamilton series. And then I am also developing a new s historical series that is also based in England um, in the mid to late Victorian era in Hampshire. Wow, nice. that is so much work. So what about you, Lane? Um, well, I'm, um, I'm getting ready for the launch oh, of Dead Men Don't Decorate and um, working on the canvas and um, I'm um, sending off the synopsis for book two in uh, the Old Town Antiques series to my agent. I have somebody, a very sweet comment here from Kelly Connors. It's fascinating projects. All of you are so imaginative and creative and I learned a lot and you inspired me. Thank you very much. That's very sweet. Kelly's great. She's a friend yeah. of mine. And um, maybe we should add our website. Yeah. Is back in, in yeah. that again, I think. Um, in yeah. case and be sure you hit um, everyone. Um, yeah, you, and, and I have a oops. free download on my yeah. website great. in the first six great. chapters. Does anyone in our audience have any other questions? So many wonderful books to read. Thank you, Susan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and I, in a lot of my book, I played Mary's game of what mm -hmm. if, mm -hmm. and I had um, something about um, Whistler that um, the painting oh. that they have always thought was, which I just, I made up, okay, a painting that they always thought was um, um, a seaside in, I think, Lewis, uh, uh, England, um, they think now it is in Connecticut, which none of that's true. All right, don't look for it because it's not true. Okay. <laughs> but what if? I mean, because they know that if it's found to be an American setting, the value will skyrocket. Uh, so, that's um, interesting. Made that's it up. Don't look for it. But I thought it was a, a good what if. I, I believe it. It's just wonderful. I mean, we're writing fiction anyway. I say go. Yeah. For it. You yeah. know, I just love, I really love making my village, creating my village. And, right. And yeah. It gives me so much latitude. Um, mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I, I feel like I don't have to be accurate. I, I am because I actually wrote, made a map, you know, so that I'm accurate within my own head and within my own village. Uh -huh. um, and so that it makes sense. And so that in one book, you're not doing one thing and then it looks totally different. But, um, I, I, you know, I don't have that, you know, the, the constrict, the con yeah, yeah. And the limitations it, of being in Boston or being in Rome or being, um, it's wonderful because they're beautiful yeah. locations, but yeah. And then, of course, was it last week or week before? It all, all runs together. Um, that um, <laughs> someone attacked the Mona Lisa, you know? Oh, really? With, yes. with, cake, with a piece of cake. First, he tried to break the glass. I mean, what kind of idiot doesn't know that, you know, you're not going to, you know, with your hand, break the glass? You're not, I mean, you'd have to have a really big gun to break. And How did he? He I mean, dressed he up in a it. wheelchair. And then um. he, so that didn't work. And so he starts smearing it with a piece of cake. Oh, my God. Did anybody learn just what his motivation was yeah he stood he up and started yelling that it was uh, uh about climate change oh my god oh, what does the mona lisa have to do with i don't know <laughs> what does the mona lisa have to do with climate change yeah I mean, yeah exactly I exactly i understand yeah. his frustration but i don't understand the mona lisa and he dressed up like a little lady in a wheelchair and so then he gets up and starts doing this and of course the guards were on him right away Right. And because uh, they're just a few feet away. Well, we wrote that in a store in a book. So yeah. Uh -huh. so uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank I think thanks everyone for joining yeah. us. Here. Yes. It's seven yeah. o'clock. Yeah, please reach out to us. You have our uh, email addresses and uh, we would love to hear from you. And Mary just said it's seven because where are you, Mary? Midwest. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. I'm in Kansas City, <laughs> Central Time. Sorry. Yeah, she's, she's <laughs> sorry. Oh. And okay. there's also a download if you want to download oh, a the books, right? In the chat. I don't see it. Did you put it? It was it was what way up at the top. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for for your Thank questions. You. And thanks for Thank showing you. up. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank okay. you. Bye bye. Good night. Bye.